Well, good morning, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started. And so let's begin with prayer. The Lord be with you. Almighty God, we come to you again for this last time in our study of the book of Joshua, and we ask that as we study more and more about your word, you will turn the hearts of our, of our souls more and more toward you, that all that we do from this day forward will be to your honor, to your glory, and to your service. And we ask, Almighty God, now that you will be with us for the next 40 minutes or so, guiding and directing us in our thoughts and in our, in our feelings. And all this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, as I said in the prayer, this is the last of the Joshua classes. And uh, we've been going now for 12 weeks on to 13. And we are just doing a little touch and go in the book of Judges. We have talked a little bit about the background, and I've got just a tiny bit more I want to tidy up on the background of the book of Judges, and then I want to take a look at Gideon, uh, because that's one of the more prominent of the Judges, of the 12 Judges that you find in the book of Judges. And we won't get through all of Gideon, but we're going to talk about a couple of the, of the more interesting things. So, we wanted to wrap up this kind of introduction to the book of Judges with three major themes. And those themes are Israel's apostasy, the charismatic leadership of the Judges, and finally the Spirit of the Lord. So we're going to take each one of those in turn. And let me start with Israel's apostasy. It's very important for us to understand one background bit of information. We think of the Israelites as monotheists, that they worshiped God, that's the only God they worshiped. But what we have to understand is that it was a very tentative monotheism. You have to realize that prior to Sinai, the covenant of Sinai, there is no evidence anywhere in Scripture that the Israelites, the Hebrew people, worshiped only one God. There's no reason to assume that they, when they were in slavery in Egypt, they were just worshiping one God. And even when they were in the wilderness, those 40 years traveling up the Transjordan, trying to get up to the point where they would have their base camp in Shittim, there's still no real evidence that they were monotheists. They were probably praying to several different gods. I'm not saying all the leaders were doing this, but the rank and file people probably were. And there's even some evidence of that when you look at the prophets. If you look at Amos 5, I'm not going to get into this, or if you look at Jeremiah 7, there is a hint. It's not a powerful hint, but there's a hint of this polytheism that they were practicing. So when they come to Mount Sinai and they are presented with this idea of worshiping just one God, of being monotheists, this is a whole new thing for them in many ways this exclusive worship of one God was relatively new to them at this point. Now there's a massive difference, obviously, between the monotheism that was being commanded by God and delivered to Moses on Mount Sinai and the polytheism that pervaded all through this region. For example, in monotheism, God is the ultimate power. The absolute ultimate power. Now we, we know that, and we think that, and we believe that, but that isn't where they were necessarily. Um, and God does not exist in the natural phenomena. God does not exist in natural things. That's a heresy. Now, he controls these natural things. He controls these natural phenomena. He can come to us in a still, small voice, in the wind, if you will. But that's, he's not the wind. We know that. And God is absolutely morally consistent, and he expects us to have behavior that is morally consistent and upright. And there's nothing we can do to manipulate God. There's no cultic ritual, there's no absolute worship service that we can perform that will manipulate God. Now that's monotheism. 
This is what many of the people believed, that every god had sort of a sphere of influence, that you had the god of storms, and you had the god of fertility, and you had the god of the oceans, and all of that sort of thing. They had a sphere of influence that they were responsible for. But in most of these Near Eastern polytheistic religions, there was a a sort of a grand assembly of gods, sort of the supreme set of gods, the supreme council of gods. And all of these other gods and goddesses were ultimately responsible to that assembly. And they're often connected and manifested in aspects of nature. So you have the god of storms, for example, as I mentioned earlier. And these gods were very capricious. They were unpredictable. And they weren't necessarily moral gods. They might do things that were really quite evil. And they could be manipulated, or so the people thought, by some kind of human behavior, some kind of ritual. Now, two of the key gods in this polytheistic religion were Baal, and Baal was the son of El, who was the supreme god of the Canaanite religion, that is the religion of the people that lived in the promised land. And as I said, that god had some responsibility or some sphere of influence over rain, wind, clouds, and therefore Baal was very important to fertility. Now these were subsistence farmers, and they existed off of the land. So the fertility of the land, the fertility of the crops, the fertility of the, of the animals, the, the herds, was critically important to them. And there was a consort of Baal called Astoreth, or Astaroth. There are several different names associated, and there are some slight differences, but we won't get into all of that. But this was a consort of Baal, and therefore she was very responsible for bringing fertility to the people who worshipped her. She was a fertility goddess, if you will. Now, here are a couple of pictures of some statues or figurines of Baal. Kind of an odd-looking duck, I think you would say. But that's who they would worship. So they would have these little Baals in their homes, uh, in various places around their cities and their communities. And this is what they would worship these little images that were made of hands, which were representations, I'm sure they understood that, but nevertheless, that's the kind of worship they they persisted in. Here's Ashtoreth. You can see a couple of different portrayals of her. Uh, She looks like she's very voluptuous and uh, fertile and so on. And on the right-hand one, you can see she's holding stalks of grain, which would again indicate her importance to them in terms of fertility. So, they also practiced at this time cultic prostitution, and this was an idea where people would participate in temple, with temple prostitutes, and that would store up some kind of of fertility energy that could be then applied to their crops and to their herds. And this was absolutely abominable in the sight of God. So that's why we read in Deuteronomy what I have in the red here from chapter 20. But in the cities of these peoples that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance, you shall save alive nothing that breathes, but you shall devote them to complete destruction that they may not teach you to do according to all their abominable practices. These are abominable practices that they have done for their gods and in so doing, you sin against the Lord your God. So that's, that's a fundamental reason why God wanted them to wipe out these people. Remember, this is an evil society that they are taking down. is because they are involved in these abominable practices. And God knew they had a very tentative monotheism. That they were very vulnerable. That they were susceptible. And it was a radical change, as I mentioned earlier. This whole idea of monotheism was a radical change and some fairly subtle philosophical differences. God's, you know, God's not in nature, but God controls nature. Well, we kind of understand that, but that's a sort of a subtle deal. God manifests himself in nature, 
but he's not in nature. Those kinds of ideas are somewhat subtle, and many of the Israelites simply did not make the transition. They couldn't really understand or discern that difference. So once they got into the promised land, and even though they told Joshua when he said, as for me and my house, we will worship the Lord, and they said, yes, we will too, once they began to scatter and go into these various cities and areas that had been assigned to them, they were easily succumbed, they easily succumbed to the, to this, to the religions of the area. And that's that term syncretism that we talked about. So yes, they probably worshipped Yahweh, they probably worshipped God, but they blended that worship with the local Canaanite worship, and that's syncretism when you have a blending of religions, and that was where they really fell apart and fell down. And they wound up treating Yahweh as he's just one of these other gods uh, that is in the great panoply of gods. So that's, that's the apostasy. That's where they fell apart. Now, we have charismatic leadership. That's the second of these themes. Now, these judges, these 12 judges that we read about in the book of Judges, none of them was elected, none of them was appointed, none of them was anointed, not in the sense of the anointing you have, for example, when Samuel anointed Saul as king with oil and let it fall down. None of that happened. They were selected instead because God spontaneously raised them up. They weren't necessarily uh, great spiritual people. Their tasks were military, primarily. They had very little civic responsibility, very little spiritual responsibility. Their job was to release the Israelites from whatever oppression was occurring from these large uh, nations that were surrounding Israel at the time. They had no particular relationship to the ark. They had no particular relationship to the tent of meeting or the tabernacle. It is true that they acted in faith. In other words, they were responsive to God when God called upon them. But they really weren't spiritual role models. And in fact, some of them weren't all that decent a group of people. Their task, as it says here in the slide, was to be a deliverer, to, to, to release them. And in many cases, their, their sphere of influence, if you will, where they released the oppression, occurred more in a local area than on a national level. Some of it was national, some of it was local. It just depended on the judge. So they were called upon because of their, their capacity to lead. They had this character that God saw in them, this charismatic character, not charismatic in, in the contemporary religious sense, but charismatic in the sense that they were magnet people, that, that folks said, you know, we will follow this individual, we will trust this individual. Then the third theme we have is the Spirit of the Lord. And that plays a very prominent role in Judges, and we're going to take a look at Othniel in just, in, the, in just a minute. But it was really under the power of the Spirit of God that these judges were able to accomplish their task. And I want to take a look at one of them, Othniel. We've already read this, but uh, just to kind of refresh your memory, because it shows all of these points that I'm trying to make here. Othniel was the first judge, and I want to read to you that section from Judges chapter 3, it starts in verse 7. It's very short, but listen to it and see if you can see these themes that I'm talking about. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God, and they served the Baals and Asheroth. And therefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushnan Rishnathaim, who was king of Mesopotamia. And the people of Israel served Cushnan Rishthathame eight years. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, the spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he judged Israel. And he went out to war, and the Lord gave Cushnan Rishnathame, king of Mesopotamia, into his hands, and his hand prevailed over Cushnan Rishathaim, so the land had rest for 40 years, 
and then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. So you can see every one of these three themes in that one little story of the first judge uh, of, of Israel. Now, there is a correlation. We've got to be careful here. There is a correlation between the Spirit of the Lord in the Old Testament and the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. But the, these Israelite people would not have seen the Spirit of the Lord as the third person of the Trinity, for example. Although, you have to say that the Spirit of the Lord in the Old Testament is in many ways a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit did not indwell these judges. The Holy Spirit did not indwell them in the same way the Holy Spirit indwells us who have accepted Christ as our Savior. It doesn't, it, it, the Holy Spirit did not indwell them as it did on the day of Pentecost when all of those people accepted God and accepted Christ and, and the Holy Spirit was given to them uh, as their guide and as their teacher. So we've got to be very careful here when we look at the Spirit of the Lord in the Old Testament. It is in some ways a different representation than what we have in contemporary Christianity. So that's all I wanted to say by way of background. I want to take now a quick look at Gideon. And so I have kind of divided what I want to talk about into four sections. First of all, the call of Gideon. Second, the destruction of the altar of Baal. Third, Gideon's shrinking army, a story you probably all know. And finally, the defeat of the Midianites. So let's get after it here on Gideon. I'm going to start by reading chapter 6, a uh, little portion of chapter 6 to you. I'm going to read the first verse, the sixth verse, and then the 11th through the 16th verse. So here it goes. The people of Israel, this is going to be a refrain, the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian, and the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Oprah, which belonged to Joash, the, Ab the Abiez right, while his son Gideon was beating out the wheat in a wine press to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all of his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. That's a very interesting passage. Let's break it down a little. Okay, so he's in the tribe of Manasseh, which is right here. Remember, Manasseh has two different branches. There's this Transjordan branch, the eastern branch, and then there's this branch right here, and that's where Gideon is from. He's part of that tribe. I want to show you this map here. This Ophrah, which is right here, that's where we think it is. We don't actually know where that city is, but that's where a lot of archaeologists believe it was. And by the way, Oprah Winfrey's name is, a, is drawn from that. Oprah Winfrey's not a Christian, but that's nevertheless what her name comes from. And I want to call to your attention two other features on this map. First of all, here's the Spring of Herod right there. And we're going to talk about that Spring of Herod in a minute. And then this whole kind of area right here is the Jezreel Valley. And there is a town called Jezreel, but this is the Jezreel Valley. And we'll get to that in just a moment as well. So that's the location. Now, as I mentioned, Ophrah is in Jezreel Valley, but its location's unclear. Gideon's father, Joash, who we mentioned here a moment ago, is a descendant of Abiezar, 
which was one of the head of one of the families uh, in that tribe of Manasseh. Remember, they were broken down into tribes and families, or tribes and clans and families and so on. Now, Gideon's name, this is interesting, means someone who cuts down or fells or hews. That'll be real interesting as we get a little bit further into what God is going to ask him to do. Now, as I mentioned, Gideon is not a, a warrior. He's not necessarily even a man of great faith. He's a subsistence farmer is what he is. And he's stomping out his, uh, his wheat, threshing his wheat in a wine press so he can hide from the Midianites because normally the wheat was threshed on a threshing floor. When the wind came up, it would take the chaff away. You all know this. And then the wheat would fall to the floor and could be gathered. Well, he's afraid they're going to see him out on the threshing floor. So he's cowering in this wine press to carry out this threshing responsibility. And yet the angel of the Lord uses a particular Hebrew term for him, which is Gabor Ha'il, which means mighty man of valor. He's not a mighty man of valor, at least not by our standards. He certainly isn't. Um, and interestingly, that particular set of words, uh, uh, Gabor Ha'il, is the same words that were used for David's mighty men of valor. He had a number of men, you know, that were his prominent soldiers, his prominent army leaders who performed great deeds on the battlefield. That same term was used for them. So this is quite a thing to say to Gideon. You can see he's saying, well, please, Lord, why, why are you calling on me? Okay, now let's read a little further. I'll pick up on 15. And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And he said to him, If now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that is you who speak with me. Please do not depart from me here until I come to you and bring out my present and set it before you. And he said, I will stay until you return. So Gideon went to his house and prepared a young goat and unleavened cakes from an ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket and the broth he put in a pot and he brought them to him under the terebinth and presented them. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened cakes and put them on this rock and pour the broth over them. And he did so. And then the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes. And the fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace to you, do not fear, you shall not die. So that's the call. Now that's interesting. You put a bunch of meat on a rock and then pour broth over it. That's not normally going to catch fire, I would think you would say. But in this case it did because of the angel of the Lord. Those of you who've been with me, remember we've been looking at some paintings by uh, James Tissot, the French painter and uh, painted a lot of scenes from Joshua and some from Judges. Well, here's Tissot's picture portraying the angel striking that uh, meat with broth all over it and causing it to flame up, and that was the sign that Gideon needed to know that for sure this was God who was talking to him. We'll go a little bit further, and then we'll uh, have some reflections on this. That night the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull and the second bull seven years old and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has cut down and the Asherah that is beside it and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of the stronghold here with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him but because he was too afraid of his family and men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. And then let me pick up on 32. Therefore, on that day, Gideon was called Jerubal, that is to say, let Baal contend against him because he broke down the altar. So he does this, 
he, he fulfills his namesake, if you, if you want to think about it that way, because he cuts down uh, the statue and the pole of Asherah, and he uses that as a, as, a, as a burnt offering. And this is an altar that's actually from Megiddo, which is just to the west of Ophrah, where we think Ophrah was. And so you can get an idea of what an altar would look like. It's not, as I mentioned in an earlier class, these are not, you know, little table-like things as we have in our church for altar. These are huge things that you walk up and you carry out the, the sacrifice uh, on top of this uh, rather large uh, plateau, if you will. And that brings us then to the next thing I wanted to talk about, and that's Gideon's shrinking army. All right, so he's taking care of this worship center of the Canaanites. Now he's got to, con or the Midianites, now he's got to contend against their armies. So let's pick up a little further down with 33. Now all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east came together and they crossed the Jordan and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon and he sounded the trumpet and the Abiezrites were called out to follow him and he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh and they too were called out to follow him and he sent messengers to Asher and Zebulun and Naphtali and they went up to meet with them. And then I'm going to pick up on 7-1. Then Jerubal, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the spring of Herod, and the camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of Moray in the valley. Okay, so they come to this spring. Now this is a spring that is shown in this particular photograph. This is the actual spring. Jean Ann and I have been there when we went to Israel. We actually stood by this spring. And those of you who've been to Israel may have seen this. It's a beautiful little spring, much like what you would see here in uh, southwest Missouri. Springs much like that, limestone caves. It's very similar to the terrain around here. And our guide said, you know, there are certain areas in Israel that we say, by tradition, this is the site where such and such happened. And then there are some where we can say with a little more certainty, we're pretty darn sure this is what happened. It's a little more than tradition. And then there are some sites that this is absolutely 100% clarity and assurance that this is the place where it occurred. And the guide said, this is one. So when we were standing there, we were standing on the very site that all of these tribes had come together to fight the Midianites and the Amalekites in this, right around this beautiful spring. And that's where very interesting things start to happen. Just to refresh your memory on this story, let me pick up on it. The Lord said to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give, to the, to give them into the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Thou, there, now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. Now that is weird. I think you'll have to agree that's pretty strange. God's saying, look, you got too many soldiers. Let's whack it down a little bit. Why don't you tell all those guys who are a little bit nervous about going into battle, don't worry about it, go on home. And two-thirds of them did, leaving him with only 10,000. Well, that's interesting. There are two lessons here that Gideon is beginning to learn, very important lessons for us to learn as well. Gideon has to understand that it is God who is directing this. God is the commander of the battle. And Gideon is to obey even when he doesn't understand the reason. This makes no sense. I mean, this is a fairly large army of Midianites and Amalekites that he's got to go up against, and God's whacking down the size of his army. Makes no sense at all. Let's carry on. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Take them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. And anyone whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, 
shall go with you, and any one of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water. That's the spring I just showed you. And the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set by himself, likewise everyone who kneels down to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouths, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, With the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand and let all the others go, every man to his home. Now that's even wackier. So he's got these guys down on their knees lapping uh, the water, and those are going to be his soldiers, 300 of them against this massive army. Now it's interesting that the word, the Hebrew word that's used for these men who knelt down to lap the water is kara, and that's the same word that the Hebrews used for kneeling in worship. And here's James Tissot's picture of those men down there on their knees lapping the water. And it is with that group he defeated the Midianites. Now let's read the last little section here and that will wrap us up. And we're going to go to chapter 6, 19 to 33. Where am I here? Actually it's 7, 19 to 33. Okay, so Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle of the watch, and when they had just set the watch, and they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands, then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars, and they held their left hands the, uh, in their left hand the torches, and in their right hand the trumpets to blow, and they cried out, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And every man stood in his place around the camp, and all the army ran. They cried out and fled. When they blew the three hundred trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the enemy, and the army fled as far as Beth Shittah towards Zerorah, as far as the border of Abel Melochah at by Tabath. And the men of Israel were called out from Naphtali and from Asher and from all Manasseh, and they pursued after Midian. So what the Lord had done is he said, take these jars and put a torch in them and then surround or get as close to the army and array yourselves for the battle. Then break the jars, light the torches, and you will, you will defeat the Midianites. And that's what you see here in this picture. This is not a Tissot picture, but you can see the broken shards of, of, the, of the pottery down here, the jars. You can see the torches, they're blowing the trumpets, and off they go to victory. So that is how Gideon, at least in his first assignment, he had other assignments for God, defeated the Midianites. And this gives you a little bit of a view of what the battle might have looked like. Here's the, uh, here's the 300 men, this is the site of the battle. These purple lines here coming in are the various tribes. You've got Naphtali, Zebulun, Asher, and the other portion of Manasseh coming in and they drive the the Midianites down here as the story goes on there's a further drive down here Ephraim comes into play and so on but we're not going to go into that so that brings me really to the end of what I wanted to talk about today but I want to take just a moment if I may to reflect as we've looked over this story of Joshua and the book of Joshua and and uh, looked at a couple of the judges Othniel and Gideon, there's some really crazy stuff that takes place. I mean, really crazy stuff. Just think about it. You have the drying up of the Jordan River just as it's time for the Israelites to cross over. Now, maybe there was an earthquake that caused that to happen, maybe not, but still it's crazy. The priests set their feet into the, into the water and it suddenly dries up. And the armies, the Israelites, were able to cross over into the promised land. That's crazy. Then you have this battle plan that God gives to Joshua. Tell you what, Joshua, why don't you circle Jericho seven times and you will defeat the people of Jericho. 
Now, there's no military commander that would think that's a great idea. You know, how is that going to work out for you? And yet it did. That's crazy. And then you have the southern campaign, and they're routing the, five, the armies of the five kings, and a hailstorm comes down and kills more of the armies of the five kings than the Israelites did. And then you have this day, this day that is extended. The sun stands still. This is crazy stuff. And then you have foot soldiers in the northern campaign against this horde of the kings, the northern kings, this, this massive army that all have chariots and they have horses. They've got cavalry. And you've got these foot soldiers. The Israelites are just foot soldiers. They're infantry. And they defeat them. That's crazy. And then as you get down further, and they're kind of cleaning things up, you get down to Debir, and you have the Israelites, a small group of the Israelites, really, under Caleb, defeating this race of giants that were warriors, big guys that were warriors. And then you have this calling of this peasant farmer, this subsistence farmer, who's not a military guy, and you give him 300 men, and he defeats this massive army of Midianites and Amalekites. These are all crazy things. This sounds like folly. And you all know the definition of folly. It's, it's, it's a presumption of foolishness. It's a, it's a presumption of, of, of a lack of good sense. It's a, it's a presumption of an unprofitable act. Those are what the definitions of folly are. But all of this, friends, all of this points to one of the most crazy thing, the craziest thing that's ever happened on the planet, in the cosmos. And that is that God came down to be with us and to teach us and to die on the cross for us. And we talk about the folly of the cross because it's on the cross where Jesus is at his weakest point as a human being, that he has his greatest glory. So all of this stuff we've been talking about, even though we've gotten into maps and archaeology and history and all of that, it is senseless if it does not point to the craziest thing of all, the most wonderful thing of all, and that is the death of Jesus on the cross for our salvation. So I hope you've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed teaching it. God bless you all. And again, I suggest you talk to Father Eric because he's got a whole course on the book of Judges, which I think he's really kind of chomping at the bit to teach. God bless you all.